Hi, my name is uh, Jesse Cheney, and I'm the middle school minister here at Cottonwood. Uh, I know that this Sunday we're going through um, one of our Explore God questions, which is, is there a God? Um, this is a huge question, and this is a question that uh, I've dealt with um, in my life as a student and as a young man growing up. Kind of the way that I grew up, um, grew up in a kind of tougher family background, a father who was addicted to drugs and a mom who uh, ran to uh, similar things as well, which eventually led to their divorce. So after that, my, my father moved and I saw less and less of him. And uh, My mom began running to anything that she could find uh, to seek comfort. And so whether that was drugs or alcohol again or men. Uh, and so she would bring these men into the home and uh, it, they were violent men. They were men that did not treat my mother in a godly way. Uh, and we were sick of it, me and my brother. And so we told her, if you bring anybody else home, we're not gonna be here. And so instead of bringing a man home, uh, when I was 16, she just moved in with him. And so that left me in an apartment by myself at 16 years old. Uh, I did what any other you know, 15 and 16 year old boy would do. And that is you know, chase girls and party and seek after my own glory. So I began doing this because the church that I had attended in eighth grade actually failed. And when that church failed, it just felt like another failure in my life. And so I really just kind of chalked myself up as a failure. And I thought to myself, why would I try to do anything different than what my family was already doing? And so I had remembered these truths that had been instilled by me, by these godly men. And I knew that there was a God and I knew that um, he wanted more for me and from me. And yet I had never truly committed my life to him. I had taken over and given these things. And so I still in this time struggled does God exist? If He exists, I, I, I tried to chase after Him, but my life hadn't changed. My life still looked the same. So I began attending another church with uh, some of my close Christian friends. Uh, and about a year into attending church, I thought to myself, well, they got me. Uh, I actually believed this. And I began to see my life change. And I began to see this truth that there was a God and that He did love me and that He did want a relationship with me began to change my life. Um, I had felt called to the ministry in 12th grade, um, but kind of ran from that, ran from the idea that God could use somebody like me, ran from the idea that God could use my background. Uh, but he just continued to make himself more and more evident and continued to press on the fact that he was there and that he's present, that he's not some absentee God, but that he is living and active in my life. And so he pushed me toward Bible college. Um, and that's where I, that's where I uh, went to school after that and ended up meeting my wife there. And um, now I'm in full-time ministry here at Cottonwood. So is there a God? Yes. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet Jesse, uh, you are missing a blessing. And if you have a middle school or a J-high uh, child, son or daughter, they know him by now and will continue to get to know him. And, and it's interesting as we come to uh, uh, this week, week two of Explore God, and we ask and answer every week some of uh, seven of life's toughest questions to answer. Last week was, does life have a purpose? This week is, is there a God? And next week is, why does God allow pain and suffering? Difficult questions. And so I want to invite you to be sure and come back next week as I try to uh, answer that question for you. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Well, you heard from Jesse and his struggle because of uh, life's issues and life circumstances that led him to question in a season uh, much of his early uh, days in his life, is there a God? And you heard his final answer. In it all, uh, the answer was yes, he believes there is a God. As I think about my life and uh, seasons in my life, grew up in church and uh, always just kind of believed and knew that there was a God there and since there was a God there and was faithful to that. And when I was a junior at Baylor, my father passed away at a really young age. And uh, really, for the next couple of years, I struggled with that very same question. If there is a God... Why would he have allowed this to happen? Why would this happen? You look around in the world, why would that happen? Why would that happen? Why would that happen? And I really struggled. I, I didn't reject God. I just struggled with whether he existed or not until I really got in the summer of 1989, I really began to search and to seek out answers to my questions. See, it's one thing to have a question. It's another thing not to seek out answers. And so I began to seek out answers, and I came to that conclusion. There, there is a God. Not only is there a God, He's got a purpose for my life. And He's actually got meaning set up in my life and in your life for all the pain and suffering we see. So that's Jesse, and that's me, but what about you? My guess is uh, 
Every person in this room at some point in your life has honestly put your head on the pillow or sat over a cup of coffee or perhaps sat at a funeral or struggled with the difficulty in your life, and you ask yourself the same question, is there a God? And so hopefully today, if you are still asking that question, hopefully some of the words that I say today will help you make that journey to really seeking answers and seeking God. So today, if you're here and, man, you are all in, man, you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you understand and read God's Word and, and you know without a shadow of a doubt where you're headed, praise God, let this be a word of encouragement. If you're here today and you're just kind of in that uh, middle season of life, you would never reject God, but, you, man, you, you, you haven't spent a lot of time studying the issue and the reasons and the, and, and, and the proofs that there is a God, I'm glad you're here. Maybe even further on the spectrum, further away from answering that question, is there a God in the affirmative, and you're here, and, boy, you're, you're, you're a doubter. You're welcome here. And I want to invite you to listen to some things that I'm going to share today, not as someone preaching at you, but someone talking with you, inviting you to continue to make a journey towards belief in God. You know, when we come to uh, a dialogue about believing in God, there are some terms that are pretty important as you and I interact with people in the world. Uh, there are some things that we need to know about these people. But before that, we need to also understand that once we've come to a place of, uh, of grappling with the question of is there a God and settling the question as to whether there is a God, that then there is kind of a, kind of a challenge for us as believers to be ready to answer tough questions to others. That's why uh, as we go through, not only my preaching today, but our life groups taught today on is there a God, all of our discussion groups and home groups this week will be, uh, uh, will be journeying through the question and with some answers of is there a God. Why? Because we need to be prepared to answer people when they ask. If they ask you, man, why do you have hope? Why do you, have the, uh, why do you believe there's a God? Uh, I think it's incumbent upon us as God's children to have an answer, a better answer to the question than just because. Because it's, it's so important for not, not only for us to have that answer and know that answer, but to have some reasons that would cause them to question a belief or something they've been taught uh, by someone else. Notice what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Put it up on here. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's where it starts for you. You have to personally gra grapple with this question and answer this question for yourself. And he goes, but then after you've done that, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, anyone and everyone who asks you, why do you have hope? Why do you believe there's a God? Why do you go to church? We need to be prepared to give an answer, to respond. And then he says, to ask to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so hopefully today, in keeping with the challenge of, uh, of Peter the Apostle, that as I share with you the words today that you would sense a, uh, uh, a respect and a gentleness in my heart and my mind as, as someone who has been a fellow traveler in this own question, like Jesse would be a fellow traveler in ans asking and answering this same question. So anytime someone asks you, why do you have hope? The first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out who are they. And so that's where uh, I want to give you some terms that hopefully you will understand uh, that as you ask them questions, you will be able to identify who the questioner is. There are really three categories of people, and you'll see them there, and they're on your answer. One is an atheist. That's a person who asserts there is no God. A second kind of person you might have conversation with is what we refer to as an agnostic, okay, an agnostic. If you think about those two words, atheist and, and agnostic, you'll see that they both start with an A because in the original Greek, if you look at the word theist, that means at the bottom, a person who believes there's a God. In the Greek, anytime they put the alpha at the beginning of the word, that negates what fathers, follows it. So a theist is a person that believes there are a God, put an alpha in front of it, they believe there's no God, an atheist. 
Agnostic is the Greek word, that gnostic part of it is the Greek word knowledge. Put an alpha in front of it, or the A in front of it, that means they believe there is no knowledge or they don't have any knowledge as to whether God exists or not. And a theist would say there is a God. So when someone asks you a question, try to figure out pretty early, are they an atheist who absolutely asserts there is no God or are they an agnostic? Most people will probably, even some who call themselves atheists, actually would fall in the agnostic category. They just believe they don't know. They don't believe they don't know. Now, not only are there a couple of different categories of people, you also need to understand there are a couple of major views of God that you might come into contact with. One is, is from our perspective, the, the Bible perspective, there are those who are theist. They believe in what's called theism, that there is a God, and God is not in all. He created everything. He is apart from everything. God, as, uh, as Christianity teaches, God spoke the world into existence. Man, He created everything out of nothing. There are three major religions that believe this. It's Judaism, it's Islam, and it's Christianity. All right, there's another group or category of people, and you, you kind of hear this in the New Age movement. They believe that God is just kind of everything. You know, the Shirley MacLaine theology that she shared a number of years ago, it, it's, it's the Zen, it's, it's Buddhism. It's like everything's kind of God. We're all one, and we just want to rejoin this eternal noose and this eternal spirit, and we've uh, popped out of it, and someday we'll pop back into it, and we're all kind of eternal things, and, and this is uh, uh, including including trees and inanimate ob objects and stuff like that. That's pantheism. That comes from that Greek word pan, which means everything. So God is everything and in everything and through everything, and we're all kind of God. You've got a little bit of God in you, and you've got a little bit of God in you, and eventually we'll all gather back up and we'll be more of God in everything. But then there is atheism. That's, that's the group that says there's no God at all. Not only that, and I just put it there for you, and there are others who who try to grapple with the origin of life or the views of the origin of life and the meaning of life. And as you think about those three, there are those that are naturalists. They say, there's absolutely no God. <coughs> Man, it just all, this would be the naturalistic evolutionist, the Darwinist evolutionist. They believe that, man, the origin of life just somehow, some accidental uh, event in history took place that all of a sudden, poof, life just showed up. Now, the truth is, that's absolutely impossible. It, it couldn't have happened, but that would be their view. Uh, uh, the second view, if you go ahead and put it up on the screen there as you think about it, uh, it's kind of the theistic evolutionist. That's the person who's kind of the middle ground. You have the creationist over here, you have the naturalistic evolutionist over here, and they just kind of want to be friends with both people. So they believe there is a God, but they believe that God created everything, kind of got it started, and he used evolution to move his way through the process. Now, I'd love to spend some time on that, but that's really not the, the purpose of this. And then there's theistic creation, those that, that, that would stand there and say, man, God spoke the world into existence. He created everything, and he did it, and he didn't use evolution at all. I'm not going to debate those three, but I want you to understand who those people are. Why is that? Well, what did the writer of Proverbs say? What did Solomon say in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13? He says, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. So if you get into dialogue with someone about uh, whether there's a God or not, ask them some questions. Listen to what they're saying. Try to say, well, you know what? You sound to me, you, you say you're an atheist, but you don't, you, you don't really seem like an atheist to me. You're saying you, you just don't know. You just don't know. For me, I would say I, I'm a pastor. And from time to time, I get asked the question, does God exist? And most of the time, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a cordial question. There are other times, uh, like you, that someone rather hostile to the faith will kind of throw a jab and throw a barb at you. And so let's just assume right now that I, I walk up someday and I've got to convince someone or at least begin to convince somebody in about 60 seconds that there might be a God. How would I do that? So let's say uh, we walk up and I'm going into an office building and I'm standing at the elevator with someone and uh, we push the up button. We're waiting for the elevator to come here. I said, hey, how you doing? You look all dressed up. You going to work? Yeah, I'm heading to work. I work in the office. Well, what do you do? Uh, I go, what do you do? And, and they tell me what they do. And I say, well, well, I'm a pastor. 
I'm just going up to see someone in our church saying hello, and their immediate response is, you're a pastor. Well, I don't believe there's a God. I'm an atheist. Tells me a couple of things about them. One is they're pretty convinced. They're ready to dialogue. And probably number three is they're an Eagles fan. So, <laughs> so that, that pretty much, that just pretty much squares them up right there. And so how many Eagles fan do we have in here? Yeah, all right, there's one over there, there's a couple, so y'all know who to gang up on afterwards. Uh, but so anyway, apart from being an Eagles fan, I, 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 you know, that'll, that, that's fleeting. <laughs> that'll go away. <laughs> but it's their eternity that matters. So as we get in the elevator, I said, well, listen, before we get out of the elevator, I, I realize you've got your point. Can I just share a couple of reasons why I think God exists? And he goes, well, you need to know that I'm pretty well read. I said, well, good. I'm glad you're pretty well. He says, and I, and I know that science pretty much teaches and tells us that there is no God. Well, I would stop him and say, well, let me just stop you right there and tell you that science doesn't really tell you anything. Scientists tell you things. See, science is just a collection of data. And science doesn't tell you anything. Scientists tell you things. And scientists interpret the data and they tell you what the data says based on their philosophy. And if you find yourself reading a bunch of scientists who are sharing with you what they say the data says, and their whole philosophy of life is naturalistic, and they've ruled out God from the very beginning, don't think that you're not getting an unbiased opinion. As a matter of fact, the data doesn't even say anything. See, data is just a bunch of numbers on a page, but that data for it to say anything has to be interpreted, and who interprets it? and tells and speaks to you is pretty important in what their philosophy of life is. But before we get off, we're on floor number one. I said, let me just give you a couple of, couple of reasons why I believe there's a God. Number one, science confirms that the universe had an origin, right? Absolutely. So at one point it was nothing, and then it became something. You and I might debate that, but the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Scientific data says, in the beginning, the universe was created. I said, number two, I would go to the fine-tuning of the universe. The boy, when you look at the universe, it looks pretty finely tuned. And as a matter of fact, the more science uh, learns about the fine-tuning of the universe, it doesn't get less complex. It gets more complex, almost as if there was a pretty complex designer that set it all in place. And you know what? I would interpret that to say things that are complex were created by complex beings. I said, so you might want to think about that when you look at the fine-tuning of the universe. I said, number three, the origin of life itself. Let me just tell you quickly about the origin of life. Here's what we know, observably. Non-life never produces life. And as a matter of fact, for there to be even one earth, for there to be one earth that could sustain any life, the probability of that happening by chance and by energy, energy and by some uh, spontaneous combustion is infinitesimal and not possible. So my prayer for you would be that you would go look at the data again with an open mind. That's the way I would say it. If I was smarter, I might say it like this. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered, by even a hair's breadth. No physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. 
To understand how exceedingly narrow this life permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be, it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. 
Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Now I wish I could say it like that, but I can't. But I will tell you, if you uh, want to know more about that, every uh, uh, second and fourth Thursday of uh, the month, our Reasonable Faith chapter meets here upstairs. You can see it on the bottom of the insert in your takeaways. And you can come and you can learn more and you can grow more and you can understand more. So you'll be ready to give that gentle, humble response when someone asks. So let me just quick, you'll quickly walk you through those arguments for the existence of God. And, and, and these arguments would roll from or flow from, uh, not really a philosophy at all, but uh, these would be four irrefutable features of the cosmos that will help you in your, uh, in, cur- in your conversation with someone that might be questioning God. Number one is the universe had a beginning. Man, you need to start there. Say, hey, the first thing it says is the universe had a beginning for years and years and years. People would say, well, you know, if you just allow this universe to go on and on and on and again, eventually you could create something by accident and by chance. Well, then, then the problem is they did the research and they found that the universe had a beginning, which is what scripture said long, long, long ago. Let me just read this statement. The universe is a contingency that requires some sort of uh, causality. It hasn't always existed. Start there. What does the Bible say about not always existing? Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There it is. There it is. There's the statement. What about the writer of Hebrews? I love this. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. In the beginning, God created. He spoke the world into existence. So that, listen to these last few words, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God spoke the world into existence. That explains why nothing became something and became something significant. So not only is it the origin of the cosmos that speaks to something creating. Secondly, it is the fine-tuning of the cosmos. You might want to write that down, the fine-tuning of the cosmos. If you think about it, let me just read this to you on the insert. You can see it there. The more we know from science, the more impressive the fact becomes that the universe is more finely tuned, listen, than we ever, ever imagined, such that the probability of having even one life-sustaining planet is virtually infinitesimal, so that it requires some type of fine tuner behind creation. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm 8, verse 3. The psalmist says, When I consider your heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in its place. What does it say in Romans chapter 1? Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, it says, For, the, for, the, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen. How were they seen? Being understood from what has been made so that men and women, people are without excuse. So that's number two. Number three, the origin of life itself. Write that down. The origin of life itself. Man, as you think about the origin of life itself and What that means, life requires just simple life as we know it, after scientifically being studied, requires such complexity, structure, and design that the idea of spontaneous generation of life is impossible. It just doesn't happen. Well, then how do we as God's children or people who follow the Word say that life happened? Notice what uh, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and following says this, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that more, listen to this, that move along the ground. Then look at verse 27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. Man, we have the best region 
for the origin of life. We have the best reason for the design of the cosmos. We have the best reason for God creating something out of nothing. And then number four, let me put it for you there, the information-rich component of our genetics. Boy, if these others weren't above my head, this one really gets beyond my reach. But those who uh, understand this, understand this, that the information cannot be reduced. The information found in our cells, in our DNA, in the simple protein cannot be reduced to energy and cannot, cannot be explained by accidental combustion. In other words, life didn't just happen by accident. There had to have been design. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 19 put it up on the screen for you, said this. He says, the heaven declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they reveal what? So don't be shocked when scientists learn more and more and more and more about our universe because day after day it pours forth knowledge that we didn't create we just can determine and we can see boys well, you think about those i i don't know what your ultimate conclusion will be but it's pretty simple that life the cosmos the design and everything else was clearly beyond the reach of accidental chance. Beyond accidental chance. So let me give you a couple of other arguments. These you might get a better grasp of if you're not a scientist. All you got to do is be able to make those first statements and say, go study it, come back, and we'll talk. But here are a couple of other uh, arguments that you might be familiar with, arguments for the existence of God. One is called the moral or ethical argument for the existence of God. Now, oftentimes you need to understand, and I need to understand, and part of the whole question uh, uh, next week is asking and answering the question is, why does God allow evil to exist? Man, that's a hard one. My guess is if you are in an encounter, in an encounter with anyone who is questioning God's existence, they will look at you at some point and at some time and say something like this, if there is a good God, why all the evil in the world? How many of you know that's exactly what? And that is not an easy question to answer. But to answer it initially, I want to first encourage you to flip the argument back on them. Because if they ask you the question, if there is a good, if there is a God, why is there evil? Therefore, what they're saying is, since there is evil, there is no God, flip it around and say, but you admit that there is good, correct? Yes. So if the existence of evil says no God, then the existence of good says there is a God. So at the very least, you and I are on 50-50 grounds. Because if evil says no God, then good has to say God in their argument. But beyond that, you say, well, let me ask you a question. How can we, together, you and I, sit here and talk about an event that happens in nature or something that goes on, and we both commonly agree that that is wrong? Because the rally of it is, if we're some product of some accidental chance and we have this evolutionary process that brought us up, we have been brought up with or we have grown with genetically the idea of the survival of the fittest, correct? Basically, the strong dominate and annihilate the weak, right? Then why wouldn't that be what's sown in our DNA? See, the reality of it is it doesn't matter where you grew up or where, where I grew up or how you grew up or how I grew up. If you and I are sitting here looking at a heartbreaking thing, whether it's on TV or reading it in a news article, we can both be crushed in our hearts simultaneously. Simultaneously, regardless of whether you grew up here in McKinney, Texas, or halfway around the world, when you see something happen like a tsunami, we are all crushed. Or we view the images of what, are, what has been taking place with some of the refugees and some of the loss of life that is taking place. It doesn't matter where you live in this world. 
there is a common core belief that that's sad. Let me tell you what. Evolution, no God, doesn't account for that at all. Romans chapter 2 does, though. Let's put it up on the screen. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. What is he saying? For you and I, it would be, hey, you can go halfway across the world with people who have never even heard of the Ten Commandments, and you show them an image that crushes you, and it'll crush them, period. Why? Because there's a law beyond the law. Then look at verse 15. It says, they show that the requirements of the law are written, where? On their hearts. How did that get there? A creator. A common creator. Written on their hearts so that their consciences also bear witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. So that would be the moral argument. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week. Number two, let me give you another one. Just we're talking about other arguments that you can refer to. What about the biblical or scriptural argument? Well, when you're talking to someone, they may reject a bit of scripture. You say, but hey, listen, wouldn't you kind of want to know what the most published, printed, and read book ever on the planet of the earth says? Wouldn't you at least want to know what it says? And let me tell you, it is not just number one New York Times. It's like number one in the universe beyond all belief. And you say, that book that has changed countless lives and countless hearts and countless families for eons and eons says, in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Then you might say, what do you think about Jesus? And they probably, if they're questioning God's existence, they, they would say, well, you know what? I believe he was a great teacher, a good moral teacher. And you say, boy, you're right. That They say, I don't really believe that he was God, and I don't know that he's my Savior. Say, so that's good. Okay, we can deal with that later. But you're saying, like everyone else throughout history, that at the very least, Jesus was an incredible example and a great teacher. Wouldn't you want to know what that teacher says? And that teacher says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. In Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, what did Jesus say? Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see who? So there you have Jesus. But then this is where you would end. You would say, well, personal experience. Personal experience reveals to me that there is a God. I'm not a scientist. You would say this. I wouldn't. I'm not a preacher. I'm not of this and I'm not of that. But man, I believe my heart tells me there is a God. Jeremiah chapter 29, listen to this. And you can just sit down and read this to them. You can say, I believe this applies not only to me personally, but also applies to you. Here's what Jeremiah the prophet says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then verse 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. And then look at verse 13 and you say, this is God talking to you. And if you're here today and in that early category I set out that you're not fully committed to Christ, you're somewhere in the middle, or even if you're one who has rejected God all out, verse 13 is still for you. You will seek me a message from God And you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So what is the invitation today? To seek God's heart. To seek him out with all your heart. What will be the outcome? 
you'll find God waiting there for you. That's my encouragement. You say, how can I seek him, Pastor? If you look at some of the takeaways at the bottom, man, I want to, I want to encourage you to go study this, read this. I'll write a devotion each and every day. We'll share some things. Some point this week through my Facebook or on my Twitter, I will, I will send you that link to that video if you want to look at it and uh, you can uh, uh, memorize it. That might, might encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to get in a life group that we've been talking about that or a discussion group uh, which are all over campus. You can know where to go those. And finally, if you want to just be emboldened in your faith, I want to encourage you to start coming every, uh, as much as you can on the second and fourth Thursday night of the month to our Reasonable Faith chapter as we continue to give the answers to the questions people are asking. Let me pray for you as we go. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, my prayer today is that one person or two people or three people would move another step towards you and towards your grace. Father, I thank you for the opportunity just to ask and answer a tough question. But more importantly, I pray that there would be someone here today, several someones here today, that would make that decision that this week I'm going to seek God with all my heart. And that we know when people do that, you are there and they find you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.